All right. All right. So uh, thank you for uh, coming out, everybody, on a late Saturday night. Um, you know, uh, I definitely think that, uh, you know, Saturday night in October is the perfect time for a horror reading. So um, and of course, um, you know, we have, I think, a lot to celebrate. There's been so many amazing books coming out lately. And um, the first one in question is going to be Will, Will Gray's book, The Devil Within Us All, a fantastic novel. Um, William Gray is from West Virginia. And um, according to him, it's not like Wrong Turn until it's exactly like Wrong Turn. And I will say that we hear that in Tennessee. Um, William's works include the psychological horror novel, The Man Behind the Door, and the supernatural horror novel, The Devil Within Us All. William takes inspiration from his own experiences to craft novels that tackle the horrors and demons of real life. His debut, The Man Behind the Door, tackles grief, trauma, and addiction through the lens of a ghost story and explores generational trauma. It was acclaimed for its compassionate tone, handling of the difficult subject matter, and multiple storylines that come together in the end. He currently works full-time as a pharmacy technician at an independent pharmacy while raising his son and daughter while his, with his loving wife. In his free time, he enjoys outings with his family, reading, and playing music. And one of my favorite things that I know about Will is that um, when I jokingly asked if um, he would, uh, uh, if he had his ritual sacrifice ready, he immediately um, sent me a picture of his newborn baby. So without further ado, William Gray. I don't know that anybody could have a better introduction. That uh, pretty much encapsulates everything about me, including my super dark humor. So it's great. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> um, so yeah, he pretty much covered it all. Um, give you a little bit of a, of a background on the novel if you haven't heard about it. Um, Devil Within Us All is a small town horror that tackles uh, themes of powerful people that can bring out the worst in others. And so... Um, so I really set off to tell a novel kind of in the vein of needful things in the stand, and that's what I did. So without further ado, I'm going to start my reading, which I'll be reading the prologue, which is uh, compassionately titled A Tale About Ice Cream. All right. So Mary Davis sat in her car outside the hospital and thought about death. Behind one of the few well-lit windows that shone like a beacon into the night, her grandmother slept peacefully. Stroke, a really bad one. Her cousin had been the one to tell her. The news had come as a shock. It wasn't because Emil Evelyn Waymack had always been healthy or anything of the sort. It was because she had always thought that her grandmother had been incapa incapable of doing something so mundanely human as dying. Her hands tightened around the steering wheel as she thought about all the horrific things the woman had done in her life. Evelyn was a law-abiding citizen, but her mortality ended there. Mary remembered how her mother had talked about her childhood, the utter lack of love the woman had shown for her two oldest daughters, she had only loved Karen, and that was because Karen had been born out of the adultery she had been committing for most of her marriage. Her mother, dying of cancer in 2013, had told Mary everything. The late night trips to the gas station for ice cream, how she had desperately wished to be anywhere but there as Evelyn had ridden the man in the front seat. Mary's mother had been anything but religious in her later life, but she had described it as sin because there was nothing dirtier than what she had seen. She told me that if I ever told, I would be cut out or I would be out on the street in an instant, and I believed her. Mary had two. Evelyn had always been decent to Mary, but only in a passing respect for your stranger's way. Very little love was shared. Evelyn spent it all on Karen's son, Reese. Maybe that was okay, though. Mary didn't want a damn thing from that woman, except maybe to see her go when the time came. Mary looked up at the shining lights and knew it would come soon. She had always been jealous of all the other kids who come, came to school and bragged about the things they did with their grandparents. Mary had never had that. Her father's parents had died in a car crash when she was a toddler, and Evelyn husband had died of a heart attack behind the wheel of his Lincoln a year before Mary was born. She felt cheated and unfulfilled as she thought about everything she had missed out on. She remembered that she had told her what she had told her husband about her grandmother. Some grandmothers baked cookies for Santa. Mine were Louis Vuittons for Christmas morning. Chris had been confused but had not asked her to explain. She wasn't sure if she could have. Of all the things she hated about Evelyn, those goddamn pumps kept coming to her mind. They exemplified everything about the woman. Shallow, materialistic, and selfish. Mary dragged herself out from behind the wheel, thinking about why she had come here. She hadn't, she wouldn't have been able to do it without the stranger. She was self-aware enough to know that. She had resigned herself to never seeing Evelyn again, even if she did die soon. She didn't expect to have any regrets, and then she met him. Everything else was a blur. She couldn't quite remember the details, or even his name, but he had given her the courage to face her grandmother one last time, to tell her how it was, to say goodbye. The revolving doors led into an empty reception hall. 
She expected someone to stop her, but there was no one at the front desk to say anything. The county hospital was small and understaffed. She suspected that almost everyone who came here got transferred shortly after. Evelyn would be leaving in the morning. The building had four floors and a basement, each one with a long hall running the course of it. She stopped to look at the directory next to the elevator. First floor emergency services, second floor maternity, third floor intensive care, fourth floor inpatient, basement morgue. All with uh, the missing letters made Mary feel queasy. She should have been downright alarmed if she had actually cared about her grandmother's well-being. If they couldn't maintain a simple sign, how could they care for an actual human being? Mary hit the call button and waited. She could taste copper in her mouth as the elevator door slid open and allowed her to enter. She hit the button for the third floor. She was thankful for this chance to say her piece and leave Evelyn to die. She almost hadn't come, but she knew now she would have regretted it despite what she had previously thought. She knew she would never be here without a pain shot through her skull at that moment, like a railroad spike being driven through her brain. She had a strange momentary thought as she stood in the elevator, doubled over and gasping. I'm not supposed to think his name. How absurd. There was nothing to think about. She had received thoughtful and insightful advice from a traveler, a total stranger, and had spurred her into action. Everyone had to say goodbye, he had told her. It's best to do it on your own terms. The elevator doors opened slowly and she stepped onto the third floor. The lights were dim and blinking as she looked down the hall in both directions. A lone nurse stood on the far end with her eyes glued to her phone. Mary kept moving, trying to act casual. She felt confident she was in the right place. She came to a stop at a closed door. She looked over at the whiteboard on the wall beside it and was unsurprised to find Waymac written on it. She pushed the door open quietly. Evelyn lay on the bed, her white hair in disarray. Mary thought about how she had always done her makeup on Christmas and put on those stupid fucking pumps when it was just the family around. She had always been made up, always been trying to prove that she was better than everyone else because she actually believed that she was. If she could only see herself now, wake up. The words slipped out of Mary's mouth as she stepped in and closed the door. They were hard, stern words spoken from a place she didn't recognize. Evelyn's eyes fluttered, but they didn't open. I said, wake up. She raised her voice enough to startle her grandmother, but it was still low enough not to alert the nurse down the hall. The old hag nearly jumped out of her skin as she searched the room with frantic urgency. Mary momentarily thought that she should take it easy, but there was something else in her head. Something foreign, dark. Mary, you scared the bejesus out of, shut up, you old bitch. Evelyn's eyes widened with surprise. Simultaneously, Mary's did too. What are you doing? She asked herself, but she already knew. She remembered now. She felt the rage burning inside her, like using her organs for kindling. She remembered why she had come here, what the man had said, his name. You think you're so much better than me, don't you? Mary crossed the room, her hand in her purse. The cold metal of the gun felt like a piece of herself, but she watched the old woman stare at her with fear. It all felt so right. You fucked a man in front of my mother because you couldn't wait to get your rocks off. You treated your own daughters like trash. You treated me like, I, I don't know what you mean. That's a lie. I, I never, I gave your mother everything she ever wanted or needed. Her words were cut off by the business end of Mary's husband's pistol. It was an older revolver with a long barrel. She could hear her grandmother gag when she pushed the barrel into her mouth. Oh, come on. I know you've had bigger things in there than that. Mary no longer felt like herself. Something had changed in her. Something had when she admit the pain again, but it did not double her over this time. It stoked her rage. What? Finally lost at a loss for words, Granny? Evelyn tried to back away from the pistol, but her head, head could not sink any lower into the pillow. The machines beeped loudly around them. Down the hall, Mary could hear footsteps. Running out of time, she thought. It was not her voice, her thought, but his voice. He had wanted her to enjoy it, she remembered, and but above all else, the job had to get done. He had called it closure. She could never remember being this mad before. Even when her mother told her about what Evelyn had done, Mary had only been disgusted. Something had been placed inside her or maybe drawn out, and now it would destroy them both. I came here because everyone should get a chance to say goodbye, but more than that, I came here feeling grateful, but not to you, Evelyn, to God himself for leaving you alive for me to finish the job. She thought about the story her mother had told her, a tale about ice cream. Fuck you. The wave of sound from the gunshot made her ears ring. Mary had imagined that Evelyn's head would explode in a splash of gore like in the movies, but was left disappointed. The trail of blood and chunks on the pillow were so little that it felt mundane. Maybe she should have gotten a bigger gun. The door crashed open, but it was already over. And that is it for A Tale About Ice Cream, which is the prologue for The Devil Within Us All. Um, and I think perfectly sets the tone for the rest of that story. All right, thank you, thank you. Now, um, you are working on, really quickly, you are working on a new book, are you, are you not? 
Uh, yeah, so I actually uh, have a third book on in the in the works in the pipeline already coming out. It looks like in late February, which I'm really excited about. Um, it's called Our Father's Burden, and it's a little bit of a return to form. It's a radically different book than The Devil Within Us All, um, which is a good thing. I think I love that. I love this novel so much, and it's it's so dear to me because not only was it my first traditional publishing contract, but it was proof that I could do it without having um like a like a passionate reason to write behind um my debut I really wanted to tell my dad's story through the lens of fiction um and the devil within us all was me proving that not only could I do it but that I could do it even better possibly and I think I did that but our father's burden is going to be a slow burn and it's a little bit of a creature feature so I'm really excited to share that with you guys all right very cool very cool uh so I'll be um taking up the reading next um my name is Andrew Nyberg, and I am the author of The Mobius Door. Um, I also have a forthcoming novel that I'm going to be reading from tonight um, called Gala Talk. Um, and then I also have a second novel on the way out in January called The Neverborn Thief. Um, that one is young adult dark fantasy, though. So a little bit different than um, stuff folk have seen for me so far. So uh, tonight I was going to read um, two short segments out of Gala Talk. Um, one is the very opening scene, and then I'm going to skip forward to a little bit further um, about uh, four chapters in. So without further ado, chapter one, the channels, the dock, offices. The lantern at the prow lights our way across the channel. It is I, Hamel, my briefcase, and the ferryman. The ferryman chews an unlit pipe as he rows, and he wears a black fisherman's cap with a dead man's hitch emblem on the temple. His face is brine scoured with a scar from a badly closed surgery between lip and septum. Fog surrounds us as it is not yet dawn. The stars look like meaningless specks of salt on a black tablecloth. I never learned my constellations, and my geography is juvenile at best. When I look back over my shoulder, I see the mainland lighthouse still, a distant dot of light on an otherwise black, craggy shore. Ahead, the soft glow of the midway dock. Beyond stands the watchtower, storehouse, and residence, and the official office whereat I am to rendezvous with Brogdon. Until then, the ferryman, who only grunted when I introduced myself, is my companion. The pipe has slowly rotated under the grit of his teeth, the bowl now turned down. If it ever held anything, it doesn't now. I lean against the stern and dangle my hand to the water. I barely feel the cold wet before the ferryman speaks. Wouldn't do that were I you, he says. Sharks, I ask. The ferryman spits. Jellyfish, he grunts. Blackens. They wrap their tendrils round your fingers. You'll be screaming till your next birthday. The many papers the Bureau issued me, upon, issued me upon departure include a small leaflet on local marine life. Perhaps I should peruse them. Until now, I regarded them as a novelty. You've been crossing these waters long, I ask. I can't tell if the ferryman shrugs or it's just the roll of his shoulders as he rose. Ten years since I've had a working motor, he says. I'll put in a word for, your replace, for a replacement. This time it's clear the ferryman shrugs. My successor will be grateful. I'll be dead before it arrives. Then he fixes his jaw and looks to the side. As a cool wind sweeps and swirls the fog, the rhythmic dip of the oars and the lap of wavelets on the hull absorbs me until the man on the midway dock, who I presume to be the customs inspector, hooks the mooring ring and ties us to a post. The ferryman doesn't respond when I thank him, but the inspector... Um, Sorry, uh, but the inspector takes my hand and helps me and my briefcase onto the dock. On the horizon, first light breaks through clouds like a candle behind stretched silk. All right, so I'm going to skip a little bit forward. Um, the protagonist, um, Hamill, um, rendezvous with his uh, his uh, uh, his government liaison, Brogdon, and he also meets L L Lieutenant Yost, um, a military um, soldier who is um, accompanying him. 
Um, Brogdon is introduced as a fairly imposing um, and uh, basically a very pragmatic and uh, cunning individual. And then Yost is um, a little bit more um, antagonistic, openly hostile to um, Hamill and him being in charge of the um, their, their expedition. Um, they are getting ready to set forward to um, the main island in which the action takes place. And that brings us to chapter four. They have just boarded their boats. Chapter four, transit, transit, transits. The water rustles around us and the shore wavelets slosh against the hull as Brogdon rises and uses one of his oars to push away from the dock. He removes his peacoat and slides the oar back through its lock in the raised position. Age has grown his belly, but the build of his shoulders is formidable. He appears eager. I look back at the motor. I cannot say that I have faith in its condition either. I am no stranger to exertion, but I hope we don't have to do much rowing. Just another concern to sit on the uncertainty of this survey's start. Behind us, Yost sits at the rudder. She makes no unnecessary motion, and her body seems unnaturally rigid. Her gaze remains fixed on our destination. Albert Tuchin is a barely visible dot on the horizon, but she has it deadlocked. If the sea gets rough, she says, follow every instruction when I give it. I don't dream of contesting that. With a sharp twist of her hip and a pull of her shoulder, the motor roars to life and the boat shifts into motion. Meanwhile, I reach under my bench and pull out a rectangular waterproof box inside a radio transmitter. I adjust the frequency to Mikhail's channel. Static crackles. He does not respond to my hail. Then there's a sharp hiss. Camp. Complete. A voice bursts between squelches. Though I can only understand every third or fourth word, the tone is calm. Approach. South, south. The lighthouse. Repeat. I try to fine tune the frequency, but it doesn't help. The signal drops down below the threshold and only static remains. I cycle through the channels again, hoping Mikhail will find a more stable connection. Suddenly, a robotic voice breaks through, speaking syllables with identical pace and rhythm. Albertaken, Clover, Seashell, warm Wormwood, Caldera, Coral, Albertaken, Transit, Hedge Clipper, Tally, Quill, Grave, Albertaken, Clover, Seashell. When the message falls into repetition, I lower the volume and check the frequency. I look to my companions. That's the Albert talking beacon, I say. Were any of you aware it was operational? Perhaps they repaired it as task of opportunity, Barrett Brogdon says. A nod, certainly possible. But what gibberish is this, I ask. Where is the, where's the security status, approach coordinates? Brogdon doesn't reply. Yost lifts her head and eyes something in the water. A rock, maybe, sandbar. Then she adjusts the rudder a couple of degrees. If she knows anything, she doesn't say. No surprise there. I turn off the radio. No good to guess at riddles when with missing clues. Best now to make all speed ahead and find within with our own eyes whether more information will make itself apparent. Over the water, a cloud cover in the distance. A mist rolls over the sea beneath. If we don't make good time, this boat journey might get a whole lot more interesting. Our path meanders among dead reefs and submerged rocks, but the water is clear with the crystal blue tint and the hazards easy to see. Yost navigates the rudder with deft skill. Occasionally, clouds of white silk kick up from underneath us as the force of our prows alarm bottom feeders. Then our course evens out. I try to let my mind disassociate. The, water has a cof the motor has a cough in it that makes clear we shouldn't push too hard, so the trip will take some time. I remember the train I rode from the capital to the outskirts where my mother had purchased land with my father's death bond. We rode one car off from the livestock car, the cheapest spots that ran the length of the line. We couldn't smell it in motion, but at every station, the chicken, goat, and donkey feces billowed into the cabin like a dust cloud barreling down an erupting volcano. I'm sure we inhaled every manner of parasite. The track we took traveled through the mountains. I'd once thought the capital the most majestic place one could imagine, yet entering the mountains, I'd felt so dwarfed that I cried. We passed into the first tunnel. I'd been in total darkness before, of course, in basements, under the streets, working for extra rations, but entering the tunnel felt like I was descending into the heart of the earth. Despite the darkness, I'd found myself drawn to the windows. 
I pressed my palms to the glass and tried to cup fingers around my eyes to keep the light inside the car from tainting by the view beyond. When looking at the dark of the world, it is always veiled by the light inside of us. I don't know what I saw out there beyond the window. Whether it was earth or nothingness, I don't remember anything beyond the cold, hard barrier my breath clouded. Even then, with my whole life ahead of me, it was easier to believe that barrier was all that was real to begin with. The motor dies a mile out. It does so with little aplomb, the single sputter followed by a gasp, then silence. A couple wisps of black smoke waft up and are immediately stolen away by the wind. Yost's face remains impassive as she inspects the motor. She gives a tentative tug to the pull cord, but I assume the mechanism is locked because she lets go of it with a swear immediately. Maybe we fix once we arrive at Albertaken, Brogdon says. He lowers his oar into the water and gestures at my set at my seat. I lower mine as well and take a couple deep breaths. The going is slow from the start, but it is unquestionably better than being adrift with a storm coming. The shelf gradually drops into the lips of the channel and the water around us darkens. The wind chills and the cloud cover spreads across the sky like we are in a closing drawer. The chafing has begun to damage my palms. I, t I have two long man desks and sat in offices. I will blister soon. Then something wet slaps the deck beside my boots. Something that splattered from the object glistens on the leather and on the wood beside. On first impression, the object is a kelp knot the size of a fist. No, it is a jellyfish. Black, pulsating, helpless. No doubt one of the same jellyfish of which the ferryman spoke. Yost's eyes widen slightly, and in, and in an instant, my gut knows the ferryman did not exaggerate. Brogdon, she calls. Don't jerk your oars so high. Brogdon's oar had flung the jellyfish into the boat. I'm grateful it struck no one. Yost unsheaths one of her machetes, reaches with the blade like a shovel, and scoops the creature over the side. The second time, it is I who throws a jelly. It splashes the water just by the port hull with a dull slap. Slow! Yost hollers. We're entering a bloom. Our rhythm, rhythm subdues. Dark shapes hover below the water's surface. Fat at the top, they taper and fade. At first, they are scattered meters apart, but the distance between them halves and halves. Clusters form and then a blanket under the gentle chop blown by a rising wind. The bloom is like ink poured to water. If one of them is, is as bad as the ferryman said, I wonder what a falling into a dozen. Sweat runs down my back and down my ribs. I'm no stranger to pain. I've been stung or bitten by pretty much every insect that flies or crawls and stings or bites. I've broken my forearm twice. My eyes drop to the pale scar where my radius broke through the skin. However, I've heard that poisons that come from the sea bring pain like no other. A tremendous splash behind us startles us all. In my own shock, I find myself half standing before I even realize what I'm doing. The shape rising from the water looks totally alien, a whitish gray thing the size of my torso. Enormous shoulders bulge and wings that must be a meter long unfurl to beat the air with strokes power powerful enough to crack a skull. From gnarled claws dangle a knot of jellyfish. My eyes follow the creature up until it is a silhouette against the impending overcast and it joins a dozen circling birds high up enough that they don't cast a shadow. Most are the size of the uh, same size as the one that snatches the jellies, but some are larger. They must have emerged from a cloud bank. One of the larger birds dives next, this one with the piercing shriek that cuts straight into my soul like a razor into boiled fish. White frothy spray erupts where talons strike the surface. Then another shriek, another splash, this one just beside the hull. The salt water sloshes onto my legs and deck. My legs twitch and my flesh pimples everywhere. A deep enough chill rests in the water to kill us should we sink and be forced to tread within it. Two, the two birds lift off, and then the sky comes down. In twos and threes they crash. The noise buffets my ears and frays my nerves because I never know quite which direction the next will erupt from. I try to follow them in their climb towards the clouds, watch as their beaks street, stab straight through jellyfish hoods and rip out their innards before they release whole fistfuls from their clutch. The dead jellies rain down on the ocean like hail. Rain down on the ocean and on us. 
The first splatters <clears throat> that hit us smack harmlessly against the horsehead prow. The second scores a direct hit onto Brogdon's exposed forearm. His hand claps onto it and flings it away. <clears throat> Already, the skin beneath it streaks fiery red. A clear liquid oozes from a welt. Brogdon roars, his baritone hard and raspy and wild. His hand slaps back to the wound site and squeezes so hard his knuckles whiten and the tendon raised tendons raise like tent wire. He draws a deep breath that spreads his shoulders and he shrieks this time high and shrill. Already, Yost is in motion, her arms flying up as she rises, a black length of cloth held in her hands. Your coats, she shouts, over your heads. She falls on her knees besides Brogdon, who has tumbled onto his side and is thrashing his arms and arching his back. His coat is crumpled on the deck beside him. Immediately she is upon him, pressing against his back, her arms winding around, her legs hooked against his. Her attack reminds me of a spider coming down on its prey in a web. Though he clearly strains against her, all of Brogdon's large motions cease. I'm sure it must be part adrenaline, but Yost's strength is astonishing. Don't just sit there, you dolt, she bellows. Cover us! I stumble forward, grabbing for Brogdon's coat, even as another cluster of jellyfish splatters across the boat, streaking the seats Yost had just left. As I crouch down, my hip jostles the radio, and something on its face clicks, static, squelches, a high-pitched whine follows that makes my teeth hurt. The mechanical voice begins, Albert Talkin, Clover, Seashell, Wormwood, Caldera, Coral, Albert Talkin, Transit. In the background, garbled, the same message again, offset by a couple seconds. More jellies strike the water as the birds keep shrieking their feeding frenzy. Water sloshes onto the boat, and a plunging body strikes the side of the hull with a reverberating thud that shudders the whole frame. I am shouting, maybe there are words in my voice, maybe not. All right, all right, that's, uh, that's it. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce y'all to the outstanding Blaine Daigle. Um, a lot of y'all will know Blaine, of course, as the author of The Broken Places. And um, of course, I'm going to go ahead and hold this one up. I'll also take a moment, hold up the devil within us all. Um, and I do have to say that uh, across all of our covers, I do believe we are all uniformly the work of the outstanding Christian Benchulen. Um, Blaine is a, uh, a high school English teacher who um, lives in Louisiana and um, spends his days in a horror far deeper than anything our books contain. Um, his new book, um, A Dark Rue, comes out, uh, is it November 10th? Yes. November 10th. And um, I'll tell you right now, I have um, read an advanced copy and um, I am absolutely dying to hear um, that book in Blaine's voice. So without further ado, um, Blaine Daigle. Hey, everybody. So uh, he introduced me pretty well. Um, I'm the author of The Broken Places, which came out in March of this year. Uh, obviously, A Dark Rule will be coming out in a few weeks. The section I want to read today is from the opening chapter. If you want to call it a prologue, I guess you could. Um, and, and it's broken up into two kind of sections. One part's in 1999 and then one part is in uh, 2019. I'm sorry, 2016. And I'll be reading the section from uh, 1999 titled The Place of Bones. There is a place deep in the heart of Louisiana where the darkness of the bayous echo echoes with the songs of alligators and bullfrogs their voices captured in the hanging moss, never to escape, never to be heard by the world beyond the wetlands. A place where black water boils within the thick, open veins of nature under the heat of the Louisiana moon, where water moccasins slide through the waveless pools of algae, eyes large and yellow in the blackness of night. This world buzzes with the beating of paper-thin wings and nighttime feedings. This is a world that time did not forget, but purposely left alone. The bayou watches as it sings. It is a place that hides its dead deep within the soil before the dead become living again, a part of this world enslaved to a fading memory of original creation. A lone snake moves through the water, sweeping wide serpentine curves in the dark of the night. It moves quickly, anxiously, hyper-focused on the shore hidden in shadow. So focused, it doesn't see the glowing eyes floating up to it 
only feels the water change as the gator opens its mouth and lunges. The heavy jaws snap down upon the snake's long body, and a violent shape rips the animal into shake rips the animal in two. The piece of it that won't be consumed floats to the bottom of the bayou to become food for scared little fish hiding in the murky depths. There are two seasons in the bayou, death and rebirth. Along this line, this world so delicately straddles that, more often than not, these two seasons, seasons merge into one. On the far side of the bayou site is a house built upon the paper bones of generation bef generations before. Large and proud, it sits below the setting sun. Inside the house, a young girl slowly walks down a set of stairs. Her dark hair is tied back in a ponytail, and her eyes are wide and green. A little boy, younger than the girl, waits for her at the base of the stairs. He asks her where she is going, but she doesn't answer. She just hugs him and asks him to promise. Promise he will stay awake and wait upstairs until she gets back. The little boy asks to come with her, but she shakes her head and asks for his promise again. He looks back at her with hurt eyes and nods his head. He will wait for her until she returns. The girl stands and moves out the front door. The boy watches her leave. She moves along the sugar cane down to the bayou. The water awaits like a beast licking its lips. Under night's black shroud, Rhiannon and LeBeau slid the wooden oar slow and careful into the bayou and pushed the pirogue through the still waters. The moon above was full, but routinely covered by heavy, heavy clouds. When the clouds would move away, the lunar glow lit the blackness of the bayou enough to make out important landmarks. These moments were fleeting and precious, for it was in those moments the 12-year-old girl would illustrate her mental map, a guide in the darkness. She had made this journey, this same path, so many times before, but the bayou never stayed the same. There always seemed to be some new bend, another bank, a cypress tree appearing fresh with new moss in a spot you'd have sworn was empty water just hours earlier. She would take these notes of the bayou's mood, file them away in her memory, and push along as the clouds overtook the moon and darkness reclaimed its grip on the world. The features faintly visible in those brief moments of moonlight became wide swaths of black paint. Bright eyes glowed, piercing the veil of night as gators floated, unassuming, in a place that seemed to be alive with every sound and shimmer. Rhiannon wiped her forehead, leaving her arm wet with a sweat that bled from every pore of her body. The saltiness dripped from her lip and onto her tongue as she spat into the water. She looked up at the sky and saw the glow of the moon behind the clouds. It was nearly midnight. Her daddy was going to kill her. It was, no, it was nothing more than an honest mistake, but even still, she could feel the slap of the belt across her legs the finely grained leather wrapping itself against bare skin. An honest mistake. But that wasn't really true. She knew where she had gone. The mistake was falling asleep and not waking up until well past the curfew. Her daddy would be, would be mad at her for breaking it, but he would get over it. Besides, the curfew was for the town. The bayou had no curfew. It obeyed no laws, not even the natural ones. But she had spent the day where she knew she wasn't supposed to be. The old river church nestled deep within the darkest heart of the bayou. That was what would bring the belt tonight. Not the trip, but the destination. And Rihanna knew it. Another quick stretch of moonlight cleared the veil. She looked and remembered the wide stretch between two trees that reached high over the bayou, like two ancient beasts locked in an internal struggle. Heavy moss hung from their lips almost down to the water, limbs almost down to the water. A certain, a curtain between one world and the next. She was getting closer. The black returned. The July air was hot and hungry against her neck. Her clothes were soaked through, drenched in her body's desperate effort to cool itself. Then she heard the sound and her skin cooled. A rattling, soft and quiet, almost inaudible. It came from the trees. It came from all around her and sang through the moss. She pulled the oar out of the water and laid it across her lap. The water shushed for a moment and was still again. Stories have been told about this place, where the trees meet above and the bayou quiets. Terrible stories passed down from old trappers and fishermen who were as much a part of the bayou as the trees themselves. Stories of bones that would float up to the bayou's black surface and scatter against the banks. 
stories of how the music of the dead would carry through the thick night air, hot air. Stories of the woman who stands among the floating dead, the bird cage in her hand filled with bones that seemed as alive as the bayou itself. Rhiannon knew the stories, but she didn't put much thought to them. Bones don't float. Besides, she had been by the spot hundreds of times and had never heard or seen a thing. But she'd never been out this late, this hour where the world of man was driven by fear to beds of safety and comfort while nature reclaimed what always belonged to her. The bayou breathed differently now, a mist of breath atop the still water, a heavy pant from the trees that carried another sound through the sultry air. She could hear them, the soft clacking of bones rattling against each other, almost rhythmic in their pattern. Keeping her eyes straight ahead, she pushed the oar back into the water and steered toward the moss. The bones clacked in the darkness, louder now. The surrounding water began to churn and bubble. Moonlight returned to clear the darkness and her eyes opened wide in terror. Around her, white shapes rose to the water's surface. Bones, bones everywhere, glowing in the moonlight. She closed her eyes and pushed forward. Her hands ached with her grip. She felt the moss brush against her cheek and opened her eyes as she passed through the curtain. The rattling ceased and died in the darkness, and the bayou was the bayou once again. Rhiannon slid the pirou up the mud and onto the bank. As she stepped out, her feet sank into the mud, cool beneath the warm crust. She thought about staying there for just a moment, maybe. The cool mud calmed and soothed her calloused feet, but the moon above reminded her of her lateness and she hadn't left the clacking noise far enough behind her to feel safe. So she moved on, the wet mud smacking in the darkness as it loosened its grip. She could see the lights in the distance. The monstrous building sat surrounded by acres of sugarcane that backed up to the edge of the black bayou. The upstairs light was on, the light outside her room. There was no way she was getting out of this. The light may as well have been blood on her hands. She reached out to her left, cracked off a stalk of sugarcane, and broke it in half. She felt the sweet nectar drip from its veins as she gnawed and sucked against the grain. If a beating awaited her, there was no need to rush home. Hell, the only thing pushing her forward anymore was the place beyond the curtain she just passed through. The place of bones. Stupid. She'd been seeing things. It was late, she was tired, and her imagination was running wild. That's all it was. Had to be. She had half a mind to go back, get back in the pirogue and, hate, and head right back out into the bayou, back to the old church, to a place where she felt wanted and welcome. But the chill hadn't left her. The things that cooled her even in the July heat, that clacking noise, those bones, that, dr that dread still flooded her insides with every thought. The images felt tattooed onto her eyes. There was a moment to the left of her, a movement to the left of her, a rustling in the cane. Rhiannon froze. Her eyes traced the tall stalks. In a few weeks, this whole field would be burned to the ground, its sweet smell lingering on the breeze. But now, the stalks were high, over her head, and the rotten stench of swamp choked her. Inside those stalks, something was moving. Coyote, maybe? They took people's dogs sometimes, but they didn't go after people. Well, they didn't go after adults. Something snapped a stalk the crack echoing through the night. Rhiannon took a quick step away from the cane. She could see it now, the tops of the stalks moving, swaying, almost dancing towards her. Her breathing escalated. She told her feet to move, but they were stuck in the cool mud. From the fields behind her came another loud crack, and a shock swam down her spine and snapped her body into action. Rhiannon found her nerve and took off in a dead sprint bare feet leaving the mud of the bank and finding the hard ground of the fields. She ran as hard and as fast as she could. From both sides came the crashing sounds of pursuit. She could see it now, 50 yards ahead, looming like a ghost. The two-story White House that seemed to glow in the darkness. The porch held up by columns as old as the South. Against the black of night, the LeBeau house stood in ancestral majesty. Her feet pushed harder. The cracks got louder. 30 yards, she couldn't breathe, the air was too thick. 20 yards, the crashing was feet away now, right at the edge of the cane. 10 yards, her feet left the dirt and found the bricks of the stairs leading up to the front door. 
In two steps, she cleared the last stretch. She grabbed the doorknob and threw the old door open, launching herself into the house and slamming the door behind her. She collapsed on the hardwood floor, dripping with sweat and mud as she gulped the precious cool air inside the house, bringing life back to her tired body. Opening her eyes, she expected to turn to her right, into the study, and see her father sitting in his favorite chair, waiting for her, not her mother. Miranda went to bed too early to be bothered with sneaking children, but certainly her father would be awake and waiting, belt in hand, scorn on face. But the chair was empty, and the house was quiet. The only sound was a soft, faint creaking coming from somewhere she could not pinpoint. Rhiannon smiled and closed her eyes, laughing to herself. She had done it. Nobody knew. Even blowing through the door hadn't seemed to disturb anything. The LeBeau house sat, a quiet, sleeping thing. She just had to be as quiet as possible going up the stairs. She'd shower in the morning. Tonight, she'd wipe herself down with a wet rag and get into her room. She'd sleep in a quiet, cool bed, far away from bayous and bones and sugar cane. She turned and was startled by the sudden appearance of her brother. Of course, she thought. I asked him to wait. And he had. Here he was, still awake, standing in his two tight pajamas, his hair a mess from an earlier bath. But he was downstairs. She'd wanted him to stay upstairs just in case their father got mad. But that was a moot point now. It was just the two of them. Two of them. Hey, buddy, she said. I'm sorry I'm so late. The boy didn't say anything. His dark eyes stared upward as his small, frail shoulders shook. His lips quivered as though desperately trying to form some response. Rhett, are you okay? His lips continued shaking, a choppy D sound bouncing out before, finally, a word. Daddy? Rhiannon followed his gaze upward to the balcony overhead, to her room where she expected to find comfort and serenity after a harrowing night. A sudden paralysis took over, and her mouth became dry as chalk at the sight before her. Hanging from the balcony was her father, Patrick Lebeau. A noose was tied tightly around his neck, his eyes open and bloodshot. Swinging, the Lebeau house creaked softly under his weight. And that's it. Outstanding, outstanding. Uh, so uh, really quickly, uh, you have uh, another book on the way as well? uh not quite it is currently um my third novel is currently in the submission phase so i'm waiting to hear back on that um i have a fourth one that's currently going through the revision process um it was my first my fourth novel was the first time i'd ever try to completely pants a book so it needs a lot of work but it, i'm currently working on that one as well all right, all right. Um, so first off, really quickly, before we move into the q and A, I I definitely want to say thank you to everybody who's been listening. And I want to say thank you as well, of course, for uh, to Will and Blaine for joining tonight. Um, and yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, you know, definitely uh, you know, go ahead and ask. Um, it's pretty open setup. If you feel like uh, it's easier, you can definitely type a question into the chat. But um, really, I'm also okay with folk um, unmuting at this point. And while folk think about that, I do actually have, I'll, I'll start it off actually with a question I do have for Blaine. Um, reading a, a Dark Rue, one thing I couldn't help but think was that um, the sugar cane may have, or the sugar cane field may have at least been in some way influenced by Little God Swamp. Um, would you care to uh, comment on that? Uh, I felt some Pet cemetery vibes in that book. <laughs> um unintentionally actually so where i grew up in louisiana was a town called uh paulina which for those that don't know geography like don't understand louisiana which most of us don't if you take baton rouge and new orleans and you put a dot right in the middle of them on the mississippi river that's where i grew up and my entire life i was surrounded by sugarcane fields and i always kind of thought that it was really creepy because a lot of times we would hear coyotes out in the fields and when you're a kid, you don't quite understand like what that sound is. You just hear like something in the fields. And then when I read Pet Cemetery, mm -hmm. the Little God Swamp very much kind of tied into my experiences, both in the 
sugarcane part of it, as well as the bayous that surrounded where I lived. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's where it comes from. And to answer Patrick's question, I actually have a reason why I don't sound Southern. Um, because I actually have a pretty thick accent, but when I went to college, I did a, a mock interview with a professor um, who told me that I sounded like a moron. And if I wanted to be taken seriously as a professional, I better lose that, uh, that accent. So what I have right now is very much a trained accent for my professional purposes. Uh, when I get, when I go home or when I get mad, uh, the, the Cajun comes out with force. Yeah. But personally, I think that's just terrible advice. I think, uh, there's a lot to be said for, um, having your own voice and not uh pretending like you don't <laughs> yeah. um and so uh well i mean oh, I, could talk, I could talk like this if you want me to do it like that's basically how i really sound let me see hold on uh i have a question yeah absolutely the question is for all of you because as i mentioned before we started recording i'm struggling with my work life and writing life and so I wanted to know, how do all of you manage taking time for writing? And this is, I'm also a creative writing professor now, officially. So this is something that I talk to with my students. And I want to know, how are you managing the balance? Will, do you uh, want to start off? or since Yeah, uh, man. How, can you guys hear me okay? I'm having a little bit of internet problems. No, yeah, you're, you're good. good. Cool. All right. Um. The answer is that I haven't really balanced it well at all. It's been a total nightmare for the most part for most of my writing career. Um, for those of you that don't know, The Man Behind the Door was a passion project for me. I wrote that book in like 45 days, first draft, because it was about my dad. I felt like I needed to write it, and it was my fastest output ever. When I wrote What Would Become the Devil Within Us All, it took me about six months. Wrote kind of consistently, and it's a pretty big book. It's about 120,000 words. First draft was 140,000 words. It, it's it's a beefy book. Um, and I trimmed it down to its bare minimum. Um, but it took me about six months. And then I didn't write for a long time. And so Our Father's Burden took me about a year to write. Well, after I published Man Behind the Door, I started working on a third book. It took me about a year to write Our Father's Burden because I didn't do it consistently. Uh, my life was different. And for all the better ways. I, I was, I'm much happier now. Um, and I didn't cut out time to write because writing was an escape for me and I didn't really feel like I needed to escape. When I felt it strike me, I took the time to do it, but it took me a, a year to write a 65,000 word book. Crazy. So I decided um, with my fourth book, which is also in its revision stages, I was going to write consistently for the first time in my life. I do an hour a day um, at my job because I get an hour lunch and um, I knocked out a 65,000 word manuscript in 42 days because of that hour. And, and really it's just having that, having that steady expectation, you know, you're going to write for at least an hour a day, if not more and carving that time out. I'm not, I'm a morning person, but I'm not a morning, morning person. I've thought about getting up early to write, but I've never done that. Um, but I, I've always kind of scoffed at people that said, you should have a writing routine. You should always write every day, roughly the same time every day. And it'll make a huge difference. I've always thought that was kind of like BS, but I'm a hundred percent with them now because I turned around and finished a book in literally the same length book in literally a 12th of the time because I actually did it. So. Blaine? Um, so I guess my first one would be thank God for summer vacation <laughs> uh, because summer was really the, the the two most recent ones that I've written, the ones that haven't been signed or released or anything like that there. I wrote those mo mainly during the summer um, because I was off work. Uh, the broken places was a little bit easier because I wrote that during lockdown. So, uh, you know, we had all the time in the world. I had all the time in the world. And then when we, you know, as a teacher, when we, when we went back to school, we went back on like a very weird kind of schedule where I think we had like, we had Wednesday off every week, all of a sudden, and just having that one day off made it a lot easier to get like grades done, reading done, all that fun stuff. So when I went home, I could write, um, 
Nat, this this past semester, I have not really balanced it well at all because work has been very, very difficult, um, exceptionally so. But a big one for me is I'm extremely lucky. Um, I have two kids and my wife will very often kind of just take them out of the house and or go on like a little mommy kid day with them for an hour to more. Um, but that little bit gives me time to accomplish what I can. And hopefully when things settle down a little bit, I could sort of return to that, just that furious state that I was in when I wrote Broken Places in Dark Rue. Um, but definitely having, being able to have someone to lift the burden off me periodically over the course of the week has been massive for balancing that. Um, I wish I had a more concrete answer, but I'm still <laughs> figuring it out myself. So for me, it's a, a little bit different. Um, you know, I do actually have a really busy house with the uh, the kids. Um, but uh, first off, one thing that really does help is the teaching schedule at a university does, you know, my, my, my campus days are Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And it's not exactly that I don't have um, things to do on Tuesday, Thursday, and on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, but it does give me a little bit of f schedule flexibility that, um, you know, basically, if I if I feel like I have an idea I need to pursue, I can pause what I'm doing for an hour and then go back to it. And it's not going to affect my actual work output in any way, <laughs> except that maybe I have to work an hour later in the day to accommodate it. But um, I also... I, I do. Um, I, I work a long ways out on my projects. Um, so, um, like right now, um, I'm I, I'm well into the draft of a new novel, um, but I'm also taking notes, charting out, uh, taking some character notes, uh, plot notes, doing a little research for two more novels um, that I don't expect to write until well after the current novel in progress is finished, until after I've released the short story collection next November. Then I'll be really sitting down to tackle new work at that point. But um, so that that's also part of it is that, um, you know, I, I have kind of like a, almost like a three or four year writing plan at any point at this point where there's just this line of projects I'm trying to get to. And something else may eventually come in that I'm more passionate about. But no matter what, I have these these projects that are gradually developing and building. And um, if I keep on that course, they will turn into something at some point. Um, but then on top of that, I'm, I'm also mildly obsessive and um, I, I do constantly um, think about uh, the writing, even when I'm not sitting and physically writing. So like I, I have a 40 to 45 minute commute every day and I literally talk through scenes. Um, I'll basically like have one that I want to focus on and I'll start at the beginning and start talking the, the, the prose through. Um, and then I'll start running iterations of the prose. So if I if I hit something, I don't like how it sounds in my head, I'll back up and then I'll do a different direction. And I just kind of keep moving it and snowballing it forward. And then as soon as I either get to work, I'll take 15 minutes just to basically transcribe the core of what I've got. Um, sometimes I'll even pull off and just quickly record or dictate something just to get it down. But um, yeah, also just like finding those in-between moments where you're occupied with something you have no choice to do, but doesn't require um you know that that gives you a little bit of freedom of mind um washing dishes and that kind of stuff is also really handy for it too um but uh but yeah just that you know that that's also part of it as well so those three things kind of work together but then also sometimes i just have to say you know what i can't write this week um and i have uh you know i've got rhetorical analyses to grade and so that's just everything that i do or i'm like you know what i'm falling slightly behind on my work stuff so i have i have to pause for three days and all i need to do is just mechanically move through these different informal assignments and daily grades until all of these piles are gone. And then, you know, I can buy myself maybe an extra chance, at, you know, an extra day or something to get into it. Um, I will say, uh, you know, Patrick asked a question for all three of us as well about um, where our next books have come from. So um, I think it was Burden, Dark Rue, and Galatok. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll just take a moment to say that, uh, you know, Galatok came from a combination of a couple of things. Um, 
One, I have, uh, it is partially grounded in my family's history. Um, there's an island called Gali Otok, which translates roughly into the Naked Island. Um, it was the site of a rather notorious um, uh, communist prison under Yugoslavian uh, dictator Tito. And um, basically, uh, my grandfather was interred there for uh, a substantial stretch um, for uh, spreading anti-communist propaganda and for, for smuggling. Um, the prison itself was pretty notorious at uh, 16,000 inmates interred, interred there and over 4,000 died from cold exposure, disease, starvation and thirst. Um, and uh, so, you know, when I heard about that, first off, I mean, I love Island Horror to begin with. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, I mean, is there a better possible setting? Um, it's not exactly a well-known location either in a lot of cases. So, yeah, it just it was very magnetic for me as a location. And then, almost, you know, kind of like like playing in broken places, actually, this sort of um, also coincided with COVID hitting and lockdown. And, you know, I was in this sort of, uh, you know, pretty rough place, especially in terms of really worrying about what's going to happen to the kids and the environment they're about to be entering into, what kind of long term effect it's going to be, because, you know, I kind of guessed right from the beginning that it wasn't something that was going to blow over in three weeks. And so, you know, I mean, admittedly, I was in a pretty psychologically strained place. And, um, you know, that kind of combined with just like the insanity of all the stuff that came in 2020, you know, is part of where the the really bleak and paranoid voice of, uh, you know, of Galatok comes from that uh, our main character is riddled with anxiety. Um, and, uh, you know, there is sort of this pervasive sense of overwhelming um, menace and helplessness that uh, uh, unquestionably was fueled by that really weird ass year. Uh, Blaine or Will? Where'd the uh, um, come uh... from? Okay, so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll jump in next. So a dark rue came from um, a little bit of a lot of things. So my grandparents, uh, I was extremely close to them when I was growing up, and they lived in a town called St. Francisville, Louisiana, which to give you guys a little bit of an outline of what that was like was there was their house, and then there was about a quarter mile stretch of woods, and then there was the Myrtles Plantation, which if you've never heard of that, it's widely considered one of the most haunted houses in the entire country. And my grandparents ran a tour a tour business where they would constantly take tourists off the Mississippi River and they'd show them the myrtles and talk about the ghost stories. So I grew up just surrounded by these Southern ghost stories, um, along with, um, you know, Southern folklore of like the Rougarou. Uh, obviously, we have voodoo, um, even though voodoo, as it's portrayed in the media, is not exactly what voodoo actually is, which is a big reason why I wanted to tell the story. You know, growing up where I grew up, I knew people who practice voodoo and I knew I, I, I kind of have a little bit of knowledge of the ins and outs of it. And, you know, I think that I always, it always frustrated me when I hear people saying like, uh, like the prince of like princess and the frog tells you it is what versus what it actually is. Um, and I wanted to tell a story that was in the place where I grew up, the place that I lived. I wanted to tell a good old fashioned Southern ghost story um with the dab of voodoo a dab of hoodoo a dab of something darker with the whole swamp witch mythology that we also have down here um but i also wanted to tell a story of siblings um i have two two younger sisters who i love dearly i'm very close to them and to me sibling bonds have always been quite strong and another big thing that i wanted to you know portray with the story was the idea of atonement um, I'm a very big fan of stories about atonement, about, you know, conquering past your past, which, you know, obviously being from the South is a big part of a lot of our literature is the South grapples with, you know, what we want to keep from our past and what we need to get rid of from our past. And I think that's something that's really ingrained in a lot of Southern fiction. And I really wanted to tell that kind of story about overcoming legacy, about overcoming uh, maybe not having the best bloodline set forward for you. Um, so all of that kind of coincided. And I call this story, my little problem child, because it went through God, like probably about eight or nine different plots. Honestly, at one point there was a hurricane involved. There's not anymore. <laughs> um, I probably have enough deleted scenes. So I could probably fill up like my own collection with just deleted scenes of short stories. Um, but like every, like any parent that watches their problem child kind of grow up and find its place, uh, what's, what has become of it is something that makes me exceptionally proud. 
it wasn't really until reading the last, going through the final edits with it, that I just kind of sat there and realized how much I loved this book that I've created. Um, and just how near and dear the setting, these characters, all of that truly, you know, how I felt for it. So it was very much in theme, a gumbo of a lot of different things put together um, to try to make what I felt was a very authentically Louisianan story. Awesome. I love how you called it a gumbo. It's great. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Um, Burden came from, I was trying to develop what I wanted to be my third novel. Um, I still got what was initially going to be my third novel in the back burner. It's something I want to work on. I just kind of keep pushing it off because it always kind of feels like something's missing. But um, Burden occurred to me one day. Um, I was thinking of what I could write about. I kind of wanted to return back to the style of The Man Behind the Door, which is like a more character-centric, slow burn story. And um, I was thinking about different things. And I kind of came back to my dad. My dad and I used to go on this annual camping trip. And it was this huge thing. His Him and his dad did it. And all their buddies did it. It was a uh, big, like, 15 person tent with a wood stove in it and like cooking utensils the whole shebang it was like not glamping but it was not hardcore like survivalist camping at all so we'd go out there for like a week with cots and sleeping bags and stuff and go hunting and stuff like that and um it was a huge deal for him um and so i i immediately decided i was like i kind of want to like frame this around it because it's the brotherhood of it was really intriguing to me and also um I, I all of those guys had a different set of problems that I wasn't aware of at the time and I still don't really know but but they all you know had different vices different things going on so I wanted to kind of tackle this 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 idea um of just how difficult it is for men to kind of address their own mental health issues as it's kind of viewed almost as weakness if you have to go ask someone for help. And so, so I went down this rabbit hole and I was like coming up with all these different things. And I kind of settled on almost like a Wendigo-esque story, um, creature feature about, you know, these guys that are hiding this terrible secret. And it's all just kind of a, it started out as a metaphor for men's mental health and the stigma around it and how, the, the sacrifices that people make because they don't believe that they're going to be taken seriously if they ask for help. And so the story started as that, and that was the driving force behind it. Um, so, so it's not quite as much about my dad as the man behind the door, but it's a, it's another story that's really close to me and deeply personal. And, um, and it's, it's a shame it took so long to write, but I think it's better for it because it's allowed me to grow as a writer as I do other things I learn different things. And it's, it's just a, become something that I I really hold special and dear to my heart. Excellent. So uh, I got a quick question for both of you. Um, so I, I always love asking this question because I think when you are, you know, like the writer's point of view is always really different from the reader's point of view. Um, and uh, Will, this is for Devil Within Us All and uh, uh, Blind, this is for Dark Rear. What's y'all's uh, favorite scenes in those books? That's a good one. Um, I love my prologue. I, I'm 100% sure that the prologue is what got me into the submission readers' heads when I submitted to, to Wicked House Publishing. My book was in horrible shape when I submitted. It was um, I had done one round of editing, but it was just in terrible shape. And I saw the open submission, and I was like, at this point, I have nothing left to lose. And I felt I really believed in my opening as far as an attention grabber. And um, so that 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 opening will always be special to me. But there's also a, a scene near the end of the book that I won't spoil, um, but it involves a confrontation between two characters. And it's one of the last confrontations in the book. And it's just relentlessly brutal and unexpected. Um, and uh, I really didn't even want to write it. The character is one of my favorite characters I've ever written. Um, and, but I, I knew that something needed to happen there and when i started writing it's uh it's what all writers talk about when they, their hands are on the keyboard and it's like they're channeling something they're not creating it's almost like you're channeling another story from another dimension because the brutality of that scene was not at all what i imagined and it just flowed out and came out and quickly became one of my favorite things i've ever written and still is to this day yeah that scene kind of broke me dude <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
Um, for a dark room, um, I do love my prologue, the one that I just read. I feel I, I really enjoyed the whole idea of the place of bones. But I think my favorite scene, honestly, is I don't want to spoil too much, obviously, but the sort the book is structured where you get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and it's very hints are given through a lot of chapters before the final reveal is given. And there's essentially a two chapter scene where you figure out what's going on and it's told from the perspective of two different characters at two different times in the same location. And they're combined with the presence of us, of another character. Um, I'll try not to spoil too much, <laughs> but I, that I, I think Andrew knows the scenes I'm talking about. Um, and I loved writing that scene because it really did feel like unlike the broken places where when I was trying to tie it all together, there was some stress there about, well, how do I make this work? Um, this one, it just felt very natural and it felt very on point with everything else that I had said, everything else that I had written. Um, it was, it seemed logical. Um, it's a little heavy. It's sad in a way. Um, but I think given the stories overall, uh, theme of atonement and legacy it really really uh fits well um plus it has my it might have my favorite visual in the story which is uh i'll just say glowing eyes don't always belong to alligators <laughs> uh, yeah i'm pretty sure i know exactly what you're talking about there um that's definitely a standout scene in the piece there's a there's a there's a couple that I think are really just excellent moments that uh, just from kind of thinking from the writer's point of view of, you know, moments where like in, things intersect or get revealed in particularly interesting ways. Um, yeah, there, there's there's definitely a couple, but I won't I won't spoil either. Um, well, I do want to say for 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 you, there's uh, one scene fairly early in the devil within us all that actually I thought was pretty uh, a pretty impressive moment. It's uh about 60 pages in and uh forgive me is that the young girl is named olive right yes yes um the scene between her and her father after she explains everything uh yes. was a genuinely touching and well-wrought moment i did not expect it and it was one of those places where you know sort of a character had a paradigm shift for me in a very effective way where i was just like whoa and i kind of set the book down for a minute and just kind of was like well that was nice. Um, oh, that was one I specifically wanted to point out, though, because it's kind of a low yeah. key scene. You know, it's not like one of the big, you know, the big moments of the story, yeah. but it's one of those that just sort of stood out as just fine, fine. Olive concept. was one of my favorite characters to write because she has the most gro most growth throughout the story. The story is so self contained in such a short term. Like, there's so much to this book, but because there's so many point of views, it all seems like it goes over the course of so many days, but it's really not. It's less than a week, really, and so. There's not a lot of opportunity for growth. And so Olive, when I put her into that situation and we see this complete shift in her personality, this change that occurs, um, she was one of the most enjoy, like great, the most enjoyable characters, right? For that reason. Um, and same with Isaac. I think Isaac has like one of my favorite character arcs throughout the book. Um, just a, just a really blast watching him going through it and just kind of rediscovering. And um, I, one of my favorite things to talk about for Devil, um, and I'm just going to ramble for one second, is the the dichotomy of the religion in the book. I love the play of Ramsey against Isaac and how they both start in very specific places. And by the end, they end up switching, but are in completely different worldviews, despite the fact that they've switched places. Like Ramsey at this position was entirely different than Isaac at this position. And it was a a lot of fun to play with that sort of thing. And um, I was really nervous about the religion aspect of the book. I talked to Blaine about the, the religion aspect of the book that I was a little nervous about it, specifically a, a scene where one of my favorite visuals ever occurs, which is a pretty blasphemous moment in the book when Ramsey's in a church. And I just like, um, I was really nervous about that, but it, it really, I think, landed for people and people understood the meaning that it's not meant to be shocking for the sake of shocking. It's a narrative about how people will use religion as a way, as a means to an end, as a way to to succeed on their end. And so the religious part was one of my favorite things to write. And um, 
Isaac was was a standout, and yes, Olive is Olive is by far one of my favorite characters I've ever created. I told you, man. Catholics love horror. <laughs> I know, man. You were right, hundred <laughs> percent. So, hey, I'm, I'm flipping this around, Andrew. So, Andrew Gala talk. What was your favorite scene? So, um, there's one of my favorite moments. Um, I'm not. I I can't spoil because um, it is very late in the the piece, and it's it, it's. It's one of those that I found personally satisfying because it, it's, it's actually one of the few segments of the plot that wasn't in the original draft. Um, Galata came out as a fairly, not finished, but, uh, you know, it, the, the pieces were in place in its first draft. Uh, but I, I added in an extended sequence at the end, and uh, there was a, uh, a brief moment in that that I absolutely love. I'll, I'll, I can tell you after we cut off. Um, but no, um, I think, uh, like, in terms of, like what I think was the most enjoyable for me to write is um, I actually am really happy with uh, the stairwell sequence. Um, that's uh, to me, that's where uh, the, there's a, a major shift in the relationship between our two principal characters. Um, you know, um, Hamill and Yost are definitely, uh, you know, sort of the center of a huge chunk of the action. And um yeah, the, the way they relate through that sequence is definitely, um, you know, a big part of it. Um, I have to speak carefully because a lot happens in that sequence. Um, but uh, it also cu culminates, though, in my favorite moment that I wrote in the piece. And I don't think this one's going to spoil anything. Um, there's a, a scene very shortly after um, where the main characters are um, clean, cleaning themselves off with bleach on the shore. Um and there's just this very human moment between them. And it's one of the only places in the story where characters actually in a, you know, strip down their defenses and their paranoia and deal earnestly with each other. And uh, that was in, in a weird way. It was something I'd actually written towards for quite a while. Um, and, uh, you yeah, when I finally got to that, it was one of those from the authorial point of view. It was just, you know, a real pleasure to write because it was a, a very distinct break in how the characters had been unfolding, how the story had been telling. And then also it helps pivot us into, um, you know, the more climactic sequences. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, and I just think, I think the staircase scene that might have been when I think I messaged you and I was like, was Annihilation like your big inspiration for this book? I think that was one where it it, it, it finally clicked. Where I was like, I'm I I, I feel like <laughs> I know what the inspiration is, but I can't place it. And then that scene, I was like, Annihilation. Oh yeah, I mean th that you know th that that sequence definitely has a major homage to Annihilation. It's one of my absolute favorite books. Um, you know, I've re I've read it uh, I don't know eight or nine times now. I've been kind of reading it about once a year. Um, since I first read it. And um, yeah, you know, it, like I do think Galatuck stands well apart from it, but uh, that was definitely a place where, I mean, I also, I, I, I love things like lighthouses and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's some overlap. Uh, there's a couple of things that intersect with Annihilation more accidentally, just because I think they're interesting and they belong on an island. But yeah, that, that stairwell sequence definitely has a, a major homage to, uh, to, to, uh, to Vandermeer. So um, oh, and Patrick asked real quick, uh, November 24 is the short story release um, date. Uh, so, yeah, In Those Fading Stars is the collection's title. And, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it comes out on their calendar on November 24. It's actually done with um, editing and uh, I'll be seeing uh, the cover in February. And then from there, um, I you know, we'll see where it goes. But, yeah, uh, it's, it's, so it's a full year off before that one comes out. We got. We also got a question for Will about his awesome shirt. Oh, Cujo! Cujo. I was choice. like, uh, I bought that at a at a um, used bookstore in Winchester, Virginia. They sell like random like author related stuff, and I would go in there like every year for two years and they always had it and they never had it in my size and they finally had it in my size and I immediately dropped twenty five bucks on it because I said I need the shirt. I mean, I can't blame you. That's a pretty badass shirt right there. Uh, yeah, man. Somewhere lying around, I have a, a Jack Torrance Shining shirt that I spent a good couple of years trying to hunt down when I was yeah. a kid. I've always loved that one. So 
there's definitely a special feeling to find in that shirt that you've been wanting to, or to get in that shirt that you've been hunting 100%. for ages. Hundred uh, percent. Out of curiosity, so Cujo's definitely uh, you know would clearly be a favorite of yours. Do you have a favorite King story that would have influenced uh, Devil Within Us All? Man, I, I want to say the stand, um, but obviously, like Leland Gaunt is a huge inspiration as far as Tanya's skill set. I would say. But I think that Tanya as a villain is is what I wanted Leland Gaunt to be in a lot of ways. Um, Leland Gaunt trades it. I, I view Needful Things as Stephen King's like um, like version of basically Dawn of the Dead. You know, you know they Dawn of the Dead is supposed to be about American consumerism and greed. I think Needful Things is kind of a narrative about that too. What people are willing to do to get what they want, and you know, it's like. They're willing to trade their soul essentially and, and do these heinous things to get the right one thing that they want more than anything. And that's what Needful Things is. Devil Within Us All takes the stance that people have become so terrible that for the most part, you don't even really need to offer them anything except the excuse to go do it. And um, it was born in a time where we were seeing a lot of that. We were seeing a lot of, you know, like hateful things spread around. And um, it's a really pessimistic book. I usually don't write pessimistic books like this, but it's really <laughs> pessimistic in viewpoint. The good guys have a hell of a hard time in this novel. Um, I see that Patrick made a note that 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 Blaine would write Haunting of Hill House. I would write Pet Cemetery, and Andrew would do the Alien franchise. A thousand percent. I kind of already wrote the Haunting of Hill House, though, a little bit. I mean, I think that my debut is heavily inspired by Haunting of Hill House in a lot of ways. Um but but Blaine's prose is perfect for that kind of story. And um <laughs> nice. I uh it's it's funny too because I was thinking I was actually thinking that when Patrick posted the comment, it's like your your debut was very much more Hill House-esque, and my debut was without a doubt more Pet Cemetery-esque. 100 percent And then with our new books, we're like we've like flipped it. 100 <laughs> percent My new book is way more haunting of Hill House. Um but I, I would say that reading The Devil Within Us All, the, the King story that kept popping in my head, and I don't remember if I told you this or not, the one that kept popping in my head was actually Salem's, Salem's Lot, Lot, right? Because of the small it's, town, right? Yeah, yep. it's a small town, and there's this really vampiric quality to yeah. what Mr. Tanya is doing and and the way that it all kind of works. Uh, Patrick's got jokes here now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like Salem's Lot was really what was in my head when I was reading it because I obviously at Needful Things is the you know it's the obvious one, yeah. Um, and the stand, you know, good against evil. But man, Salem's Lot was just in my head that whole time, just with that that vampiric quality that not only because I I felt that not only was obviously Tanya and uh, Ramsey were kind of controlling a lot of things, the town itself almost took on that vampiric quality the more yeah. it got corrupted by what they were doing. Yeah, no, 100%. King, I mean, I, I always say, I think that um, The Devil Within Us All was me um, was me not really trying to find a voice, but wanting to tell a story that was a homage to all the horror that I grew up loving and that shaped the writer that I wanted to be. And so so I think Our Father's Burden is me kind of discovering the kind of writer that I, that I definitively, I think, want to be. Um, and I'm just going to move in that direction. I'm actually about to start a new draft. Um, soon and my pitch for it is that it's um pet cemetery meets mary shelley's frankenstein so i'm really <laughs> excited for it um, oh hell yes and so, nice. so i'm really excited to get into it and it's gonna have a lot of like really good like literary aspects to it too i'm like i've been writing down key scenes and i'm about to dive into that once i have a have my fourth book edited enough for submission so hey so I actually... <laughs> patrick said signed <laughs> 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 So I actually have a question for Andrew, just because um, I kind of know the answer, but I think the readers would be very, very interested to hear this. Um, so Galatok, for those that don't know, was not originally signed under Wicked House. It was signed under a separate uh, a separate publishing house. And me and Andrew were actually talking. We were messaging on the day about that, on the day where it ended up, Wicked House kind of took over. Um, and I'm really freaking glad it did because that book is fantastic. Um, and it deserved to be seen and cared for by people that really truly love it. So, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of explain like the process, like what happened? Like, I think that's just really interesting. So, 
Yeah, I mean, so the first, the, this first step to it is just kind of saying that, uh, okay, so, you know, Mobius Door came out in April, um, but Gala Talk was originally signed to the other press before Mobius Door was signed. Um, so, you know, it had signed with this uh, with the press, and I'm going to leave them unnamed because I will say they were professional, they were polite. I mean, I never really had any negative things to say. It's just, um, like, their communication was extremely slow. Um, I would send them a message and it would take two, three weeks to hear hear back from it. So even if I had a simple question like, hey, when's this book coming out? Yeah, I mean, I I, I would have no idea when I'd hear back. Um, so that was kind of the first, you know, the, some of it. But, you know, they clearly were oppressed that also did not have any faith in their titles. Um, so, you know, I know, for example, that some of the responses I got when um, I was, you know, negotiating the contract, um, you know, they, they really did kind of tell me that. And, you know, at the time, though, I had no books signed. Um, I had a book of poetry out that um, honestly, you know, it really didn't move well. Um, you know, I'm so pr I'm proud of it as a book, but um you know, I had a really hard time getting visibility, but I mean, it's also poetry. So, you know, you never really know why. Um, but uh, so, you know, I, I was kind of at a stage where um, I was like, well, you know, I'd love to get this book out. I, you know, I really do believe in it, but um, you know, I, uh, I, I had had a, a lot of agents, uh, sorry, I had a lot of agents almost take it. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I actually got this weird, like the final draft came about actually, because I made revisions from a, you know, a revise and submit re request from an agent who just, you know, said they loved it, that, you know, that, uh, you know, that they wanted just to see a couple of, it was significant stuff. It was uh, cutting about 30 pages out of the opening and, and adding something into the ending. And, uh, you know, but I was like, okay, you know, that's actually pretty reasonable. I can see why you'd want that. And I think this may turn into a better book. And, you know, when I, when I made the revisions, I actually was really happy with them. I, I added some of my favorite stuff into the book. Um, and, uh, I sent it back to him and I got a two sentence form response. Um, and, uh, you know, it was like, thank you for your interest in, in, uh, in my press uh, or in my, in my agency. Um, you know, this book doesn't fit, fit our needs at this time. And, you know, I, I'd gone back and forth with this guy, you know, like I'd, I'd communicated with him about the changes and, you know, given him updates on where I was in it. And, you know, so like, it was this really dispiriting thing. And, um, so yeah, I sent, I sent it off to this, you know, press I didn't know much about. And, um, so then kind of fast forward, you know, um, I'll say, say straight out, you know, I mean, Wicked House has been such a fabulous experience, you know, um, you know, bringing Mobius out was was just awesome. And I had great communication. Um, you know, Patrick is is an incredible, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of how much he's uh, he's willing to talk to us, um, you know, and it's, you know, phenomenal communication, um, you know, great staff. I mean, you know, working with Christian for the cover, working with uh, Camille um, for editing, and then, um, you know, Guy for proofreading. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, we had uh, an issue with one proofreader, and so we had to replace it. And, you know, one thing I kept seeing was that step by step by step, Wicked House was really, really devoted to making quality books. And meanwhile, the other press in the same amount of time had sent me one round of edits where basically the only thing they had done was uh, one of the characters is named Brogdon. And I had mistyped it about 12 times as Brodgan. That was about the only thing their editor actually pointed out. And the funny thing is, is while I was going through their edits, I actually was catching ed you know, editing issues myself. And then the final straw was... Um, Man, you know, I, I was talking to him about the trying trying to get a cover together with them, and it was this weird, like, two month dragged out process. And uh, the mock ups I got were terrible. Um, I re that's the one really negative thing I'll say about the press is that, that you know they were polite, they were nice, but you know, their cover design looked awful. I looked at you know I, I re went back through their other covers, and I was just like, okay, these these are not good. Um, it's not, this is not going to speak well for the product. It's going to be hard to market. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm looking at the Mobius cover, which is just, you know, I love how that turned out. Um, and so, yeah, um, at that point, you know, I'd already kind of been talking a little bit with Patrick about this other book and, uh, you know, about how it was taking forever to come out. And I have a friend who's uh, uh, an agent for a nonfiction uh, company. So like, she, she can't help me really, but I was like, Hey, is it possible for me just to like bail out of this contract? And she actually helped guide me through the process. She wrote me a mock letter, um, you know, it's a you know, termination of terms uh, uh, letter. 
um, you know, that I was able to sort of adapt to my situation. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, we ended up having an amicable dissolution of the contract. And then, uh, you know, I sent it uh, immediately into uh, the Wicked House and, uh, you know, they were extremely excited about it. So, yeah, I mean, it was this weird process. And, um, it, you know, one thing that's, uh, that I, I do love that I pointed out to a few people that where this has come up is that, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, authors really do need to sort of know that, you know, contracts aren't these ironclad things, honestly, that's until there's actually um, money invested, um, until the book has come out and those kinds of stuff. I mean, you, you can you can terminate any time. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people sort of sign stuff without thinking and then they're like, oh, God, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trapped in and they start looking at the press more and they start getting, you know, uncomfortable with it. I, I've seen I've seen that happen to a lot of independent publishers. So uh, or, you know, independent authors. So, um, yeah, it was really cool to know that, um, you know, there really are recourses if you feel like the situation isn't going to do well for your book. Um, yeah, the long story, you know, long story short, uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, it, so, it is, I actually have something new that just came up. If it seemed like my eyes were kind of away, it's because I was in the middle of signing a contract. So uh, Patrick's little jokes. Um, but I can now announce that my third book, A Dark and Endless Sea, has just been signed to Wicked House. <laughs> well, shit, cool. Hell yeah. Awesome, Outstanding. Man. You just keep like edging ahead of me just a little bit. <laughs> I got to start writing faster. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Thank you. We we all got really lucky. I mean, Patrick's, you know, in the comments creeping around like he always <laughs> does, but but I mean, but I mean not to inflate his ego too much, but we all got really lucky. I mean, when I signed my contract, um I think Mr. Nightmare was like just coming out. I mean, this whole thing was a a huge leap of faith. I yeah. mean, really had no clue what we were getting into and i mean i i've been really advocate talking to other authors that i think that you know wick house publishing is like the best um publisher that you can work with because it's like like i mean i look at other bigger publishing houses and they don't support their authors the way that patrick does i mean <laughs> the, the fact that i mean like out of out of however many books have come out since they've you know you know started releasing books so many of them have been number one bestsellers in multiple categories. So many of them have gotten book bub deals. And I mean, we've just been slowly taking the world by storm storm. And I mean, yeah, we have good books, but I mean, without a good publisher about backing us, it's not going to happen. I mean, he somehow managed to find the best authors, the best cover designers. I mean, the best cover designer Christian is just like a force of nature. I mean, I can't wait to see what he does with Burden. I've got like a mock-up that I'm going to show him and I think he's just going to like blow me away. <laughs> hey, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't we all get signed back to back to back? I think um, that that would be pretty accurate because... Yeah, I, like honestly, I could be wrong on my dates, but I'm pretty sure I signed right before Mr. Nightmare came out. Um, yeah. I don't think I had, I don't think, you know, I don't think a Wicked House had any books out yet at that point. I think that I got my contract offer like either the week before it came out or the week it came out, 100%. Yeah, because if, if I'm book, not mistaken, oh, I'm sorry, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. My book was supposed to come out after Andrew's, but because of the, the editing issue that I ran into with the editor quitting, we had to kind of push it off to the, the following month. And so we did June instead. And so David's book came out in mm. May instead of mine. Right. And so I was, I was definitely signed right after Andrew. Yeah. So yeah, because that, that's how it was. Because the, fir the first batch was Nightmare, Down the Hollow, oh, wow. Suffering. And then I think we were the next batch that came. So yeah, we, we were back to back to back. Then, you know, it's, it's funny because like, you know, I learned about the press, press through a Facebook ad. They uh, do. Same. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, uh, like, uh, you know, you know, I've been, I've been looking for, uh, for, you know, submission places for quite a while. You know, I was sending a lot of stuff out. I had, you know, three books going out actually. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was, it was the most like unassuming and simple ad, but, uh, you know, it's, it's funny how those things begin, you know, um, it, it, it was such a radical and unexpected turn and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's been fabulous so far. Yeah, I can only imagine how crazy there. I'm like gonna like push to get base edits done of my next book because I want to get it on the calendar for 2024. Because I can only imagine how many submissions Wicked House is about to get after how it's blown up 
it's just like I can only imagine like the first wave of you know like the diversity submissions which is an awesome thing to do I think I think that's a great thing that's going to be a lot and then when open submissions hit in November uh somewhere I think 17th that's going to be absolutely nuts (laughs) I I don't envy the submission readers (laughs) No. Yeah, I'm curious to see if I'll have my next book uh, ready for submission by the time that rolls around. Uh, it may take a little bit longer, unfortunately, but uh, no, you don't have a choice. I need I need space horror. <laughs> hey, I'm pitching this one as the deep in space. So um, uh, it's, uh, is it going to be as twisted as Nick Cutter is? Because, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> or is it um, Omakatsu's the deep? Wait a minute, which is the deep is it here? Wait uh, a minute. Well, you know, weirdly, actually, um, people have been telling me that I need to read more Omakatsu, but no, it's it, 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 I would compare it to Nick Cutter's the deep. Really, it's more, you know, it's it's more, I don't know, Event Horizon meets the Martian, um, gotcha, or something like that. Um, is that's how I thought of it until it, until it sort of clicked that I that you know, the deep in space was a nice simple pitch that I think a lot of people would sort of recognize yeah. right away um but it's definitely got some twisted stuff uh it's uh it's got some like i'm hoping it's gonna have some pretty insane twists to it or at least things that people will recognize as pretty crazy twists i got really into the science of this one um and so that's why i'm calling it science fiction it's like 80 percent science fiction and maybe 20 percent horror um but um yeah I, i'm hoping to have it ready in time but you know unfortunately october is also just uh, a crazy crazy month so really i'm only going to have november to work on it aside from yeah. little bits and pieces <laughs> i eventually is awesome absolutely oh that's some of my formative stuff uh you know uh i mean of course uh you know like jaws and stuff like that go without saying but the uh, the beast was always a favorite of mine when i was a kid i love giant squids oh I, that's my favorite eventually excellent i, oh, I adore that book as a matter definitely. of fact so I, I will i will say this so my, my newest book is the one that just got signed it's a nautical horror with a little bit like a little bit lovecraftian and the main character's name is wit which is a reference <laughs> to Whip Darling in the Beast. That was the whole reason why I named him that. Nice. That's excellent. Also, just so you guys, everybody knows, me and Blaine are like on the same wavelength. I'm just like, yes. like, a, like literally like a couple books behind him. So my fourth book I'm, that's hitting editing is called, um, it's going to be called, as long as the title doesn't change, It Sleeps Below, which... <laughs> I absolutely love that title. The, the book began with the title. Um, I had like the idea a little bit and the, the title just clicked and I'm kind of pitching it as like um, almost like the night house meets <laughs> like Call of Cthulhu. It's got like some like very night house movie-esque aspects to it, which is like that. Um, I'm trying to think who was in it, but it's um the, her husband dies and she starts hitting like having weird like supernatural experiences and so um i'm like pitching it as that um there's a lake at the center of it um but i'm pitching it as that um but it's you know it's uh my first cosmic horror foray it's also my first book i'm right i wrote in entirely in first person with a few (laughs) small excerpts which i'm really excited about i've never been a really big first person lover guys i've been really like anti it and a lot of that is reading King. I've loved like the expansive worldview of all these characters. I think there's so much to offer there. Um, but I've been reading more first person books as I read more indie um, and as I read others. And a huge like as far as structurally, I actually read um, The Only One Left by Riley Sager. And I was like, I really want a huge mystery aspect to this book. And and say what you will about Sager. Some of, some of Sager's books are great. Some of them are really not great in my opinion. I enjoyed The Only One Left, and it definitely formed a lot of my, the way I, I came about this book in a different way, which is really cool, so, but I was talking to Blaine about it, and he was like, yeah, I wrote, like, a nautical, like, book, and I was like, okay, well, I've got a lake in my book, and Our Father's Burden takes place out in the woods, and so I'm following Broken Places. The only thing I beat him at was Haunted Houses. Only thing I beat him at was Haunted Houses. <laughs> Did we see the co-write? I know, right? We should. <laughs> That'd be some twisted stuff. All right. Does anyone have any other questions? Is 
<laughs> oh god. <laughs> We're all gonna sit here for 10 minutes waiting for Patrick to ask a question and he's not gonna say anything. He's just gonna leave it at that. Oh okay. Okay, so actually wants... a real question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so um the pitch for Dark and Endless Sea is I wanted to write a story very much with the idea of like what if uh Moby Dick had been written by H.P. Lovecraft. Right. And the original title of the book was actually called uh, Leviathan, which I liked it because it really tied into there is a biblical nature. Uh, not so much like I'm trying to sit here and be like pressing on that. Uh, it, it, but Patrick uh, was kind enough to inform me that... Um, there's like 45 different books that have all been written titled Leviathan. And they're all very much like in this kind of creature feature uh, sort of genre. And this really isn't a creature feature. It's it, it it's a creature feature much in the way that Moby Dick just kind of lingers off in the distance of that novel. The entity in this one is very much the same way. Um so I we, we, I kind of sat down thinking about like uh you know what's a what's a what's another good title? I came up with a few other ones at this point. Um Patrick is pestering me, and uh <laughs> uh I was basically just like I had a, a few ideas, and there was a particular line in the book that mentions um uh, when the characters have all gone, you know, certifiably insane that the human mind is very much like a dark and endless sea and i sent that to him he said i think his exact words were hell yes um so it's 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 very psychological um it takes it does take place it takes place on an uh on a crab fishing ship in the bering sea um and it deals with a main character who cannot remember his entire life and he bore he, he he feels this voice has called him across the entire continent. There um, may or may not be a reference to a certain abandoned town in the Yukon on his travels. <laughs> um, and he finds a note stapled to his hotel door, a hotel he's like just snuck into one night, guiding him towards this crab fishing ship, which is. Uh, captain by a captain who doesn't seem to really give a flying crap about the fishing he has ulterior motives and from there on the story goes from there awesome um so i actually have a quick question for will just because we had talked a little bit uh, about our father's burden and about like the whole the whole wilderness like thing that me and him had kind of been on the same wavelength um so given the fact that Patrick mentioned you would be the one to write Pet Cemetery, you mentioned earlier that it's kind of got this Wendigo flavor to it. Like how much uh, did that kind of mythology play a role in our father's burden? So I actually, um, I based the, I, I actually, when I wrote the book, it wasn't like a, like a Wendigo at all. It was um, like an original creature and I was writing it and I wanted to to stand out a little bit. Um, because often enough, like, I mean, you know, urban legends differ from area to area and I really wanted to write Appalachian horror, um, with this and have like a, like a mythological creature aspect to it. Um, but I didn't want it to be some cut and dry, really simplistic, like this is this creature. This is the creature you read about, watched movies about 15 million times. So like, I knew that I wanted it to be based off of that, but I created a wholly original creature and I changed its appearance radically in edits um, after the fact. And so, um, but I, I just kind of, I, I the creature really plays like second fiddle to what's going on in the story in a lot of ways. Like the horror is there. Um, it's a really, really tense book. There's a, the, whenever the, there's interactions between the characters and the creatures, it gets really tense. Um, but there's also this like unbearable sense of dread, I think, through the middle chapters of the book, even when the creature's not there, because you're just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop, which was a really exciting thing to do. I think with Devil Within Assault, it was like a 
it was a steady, slow windup. Like, you know, things are coming. There are random events where it spikes and it kind of comes back down. But for the most part, it's constantly growing and winding up. Um, and then, you know, you reach the breaking point at part three, which I mean, I just need to, to say that even to this day, I love what I named the parts. I remember when I was writing The Devil Within Us All and I named part three, which um, which I'm not going to spoil here. But the, the, the parts in the book start out with something like it's a little slice of heaven. And then part two is everything's going to be okay. And then part three is a radical departure from that theme of like, it's going to be all right. And I remember laughing when I wrote that scene or that, that name for the part three, because within the first chapter, like I pulled the rug out from under everybody, I think. And so um, it was just a really blast to write that too. So, I mean, Awesome. Patrick said he prefers the good guys to lose or mostly lose in dark endings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Patrick said we'll never leave. Let's see what he's got for us. I do agree that I think that like dark endings are at least like, yeah, mostly lose. Like I think Devil Within Us All is like a really good balance. But um, Broken Place is a good example of dark endings. I love broken places blade and the way it ends is perfect so that was so that's actually kind of uh been i don't want to say a, a craw but when i wrote the broken places i very much wanted in my mind it's a very bittersweet ending um the way that i wanted to you know portray it was i wanted it to be as dark as humanly possible but i wanted there to be that little light in the um, last epilogue Yes. Nailed it. Um, and I've had some reviewers that have been like, it's just completely depressing. And I'm like, well, I didn't want that. But um, but at the same time, I feel like the dark the I I the darker the context, I feel like the brighter the light shines when it's actually there. So I think that if you kind of hold back on your endings to the point where you don't want to make them, you know, overly dark, I think you lose a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. I think <laughs> you lose, I think you lose a little bit of uh, the rawness and the realness of it, I think. And I think honestly, the broken places was not supposed to end the way it ended. Um, a dark root was actually not supposed to end the way that it ended. I, it was almost like at a certain point I realized, crap, this is not, this is going in a different direction and story it was the itself. story wanted it and the more i thought about it and truth be told i think i actually like the ending of a dark room better than i like the ending of a broken of the broken places i think a dark room um i'll put it to you this way the the ending of a dark room made my dad actually upset right. like he was <laughs> like he was mad at me um even though i'm very very much i think the ending is very bittersweet um i felt like it was the only ending that worked for the story and looking back i'm like i don't think it could have ended any other way and the broken place is one of the things that i've always wondered is like um if you felt like the ending wasn't you know happy okay what exactly qualifies happy that this dude just walks away after witnessing everything he's witnessed and just lives with himself so I, I've got a couple thoughts on that. So so I'm with you 100% on like, um, the, like, no matter what the ending is, whether it's positive or negative, I think that whatever's right for the story is the right move. Devil Within Us All, I actually did not write the ending of that book when I finished the first draft. I got to the final confrontation, got to the point where it was resolved, and I just stopped writing. I didn't touch that book for six months because I was like, I have no idea what I want to do with it. I was like, I know what I want, but I don't know what's right for the story. And so I ended up writing like three drafts of the ending. And the one that I settled on is the one that's in the book. Um, but it's a, it's not the ending that I wanted at all. Um, there was an ending where a certain character lived. He, you know, he got to walk away after everything. Um, and I really wanted that ending, but it just didn't sit right. And the same with Our Father's Burden. Our Father's Burden was originally a 55,000 word manuscript. When I went back into edits, I added 10,000 words to the ending and like leaned heavily into some character development and just closing out some character stories. And um, it was so much better for it. And it's not where I expected it to go at all. Um, but as far as like the darkness goes, um, it goes into what I've been saying about horror. I've been doing some like book, like um, I did a, a speech at like a 
Kiwanis Club in Winchester. It's just like a group of old people. They asked me to come talk about my books there, which it's so funny how many old people have read my horror novels. I think it's great. But um, I told them at the beginning, I said, you know, um, I write dark fiction. I was like, if you want to be really technical with it, it's horror. Um, but I think that horror is a, is a beautiful thing. I think that it um, it's less about trying to scare people. And it's it's more about writing something that speaks to somebody um, in a way that, you know, straight literature, like regular literary fiction can never do. I think that people are attracted to horror because it's a uh, beautiful thing where it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not about the evil and the atrocities committed, but the good people standing up in the face of that evil and the adversity they, they tackle. These great people can tackle these horrible acts, these horrible monsters then you know our lives aren't so bad we we find we find solace in that we find ourselves in those characters and i think that that's what has made horror such a tour de force even to this day and why it's slowly starting to reemerge i completely agree with that completely it's, it's honest in a way that a lot of genres can't be honest yep and i'll and I, I can say that so the original ending of the broken places um ends with ryan spoiler alert if you haven't read the broken places um <laughs> mute, yeah, i'll give you a chance to mute uh but the original ending actually was the ending happens he has the confrontation with the thing that's been tormenting him uh what happens to the cabin happens and he actually walks back to town and as he walks the entire way the animals are just watching him leave and I changed it to add the epilogue and have the scene with the owl. And to me, while the new one is much is significantly darker, I think it's more heartfelt. I think it's more honest. And I think it really, I think it really ties into what I was trying to say throughout the course of the entire book. Um, you know, the book, a lot of the book is very heavy and talks about the way that pain has a way of fundamentally changing you on a almost cellular basis. And I feel like the ending ties that in well. Um, and I can understand why, you know, someone who someone may not like the darkness and the heaviness. But as you know, I think as authors, we all kind of write what we want to read. And the one thing I value in my fiction more than anything else when I'm reading is I want honesty. I want authenticity. I want the story to feel like it mattered. I don't want cheap. <laughs> uh, it's fun. It's fun listening to all the, uh, all, all the conversation about alternate endings, uh, you know, cause it's funny, like, you know, in working on Mobius, um, you know, Mobius, uh, its biggest problem in composition was that it did not have an ending for the longest time. Um, and uh, like, really, the, the ending is is very much the linchpin that holds the whole story together, because the original title for that book wasn't Mobius Door. It was, uh, it was called The Limit Men. Um, and originally, um, the the villain was going to be uh, it was Vele. It was Vele's and, um, you know, on, as one villain and then something similar to what you see now in the final version, the abomination, but um, it was actually, um, it was the limit men, Patrick. Um, and uh, it basically, instead of the abomination, there was many beings that were attempting to come through the door. Um, and then I, I decided to turn it into something a little more, more of a primal force um, in a later, uh, a later iteration of the, of the material. But, Really, though, when I was re I was revising it, I cut about 400 pages total during the process of composition, um, you know, one big 300, 250 or so page gutting. And then other times I just dropped chunks in there and, and storylines. But um, when um, I was revising it after cutting the, the large doing the large cut, I was redoing the opening and I made one tiny change to the opening description where um, the door's frame is kind of twisted in on itself. And that's where I kind of came up with the idea of calling it the Mobius door. And then that brought me to the ending where you end up where you begin, but you're also in a different place. Um, and so conceptually that became the guidance for composing the narrative. But coming to the, the reason that ties into the larger conversation is to me, the horror um, that I was really going for 
in the Mobius store was that um, I want every character to be um, undone by their best intentions. And so all throughout the story, every almost every victim character, they're actually at their best when they die. Um, so, you know, you have the cop who, um, you know, is, is, is a very forgiving and decent character, but, you know, he dies attempting to sacrifice himself to save his girlfriend. You have the father who, um, you know, uh, uh, helps out the the couple outside of the gas station, even though he's been kind of a jackass up until then. But when it comes down to it, when people are in need, that's when he decides to really try to do something. And then when that backfires onto him, you know, his hit, he falls to his next recourse, which is attempting to save his son. And so, you know, that also ends up in his death as well. And that's a, a consistent theme all throughout that every character is attempting to do the thing that's most important to them. Um, you know, Percy is trying to take care of his mom and trying to get back to her, even though he keeps screwing it up, but his heart's in the right place. And you know, that ends, you know, we know how that that scene ends as well. Um, so, you know, having the character at the end, you know, basically returning through the door as a way to destroy oneself, but return everything else, you know, was very much an iteration and an inversion of, um, you know, that same element. But I, I like horror where we don't have characters deliberately making bad decisions where, you know, goodness and doing the right thing get turned on its head. Absolutely, absolutely. So Patrick apparently wants to know which of my three books. If I'm hoping there's like a hint here that he's that hasn't told me yet, uh, which of my three books was going to be a movie? Uh, what would it be and why? I will I'll hold back on the third one because the third one is still an unfinished product. It still needs work. Uh, I honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I love these two books I've written so far. I really do like in, in the most sappy, in the sappiest way humanly possible, if I'm being honest with you. Um, and I love them both for very different reasons. Um, I think that the broken places would be, it'd be very cool to try to create that ethereal kind of feeling of otherness on the screen. But man, I think a dark room, you can make that thing dripping with atmosphere. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't. I really don't. Um, I, I I I would say uh, one one thing I would like I, I would love about the broken places being made into a movie is that I think it would be awesome on the screen to see friendships between three male characters portrayed in an honest way. Um. I, I feel like there's a lot, a lot of times when you have like a bunch of male characters together, they kind of all end up just devolving into stereotypes. And I don't like that. Um, so I think it's very, it's, it's very kind of dismissive of the way that men handle crisis. Um, I think we'll touch, we'll, we'll touch on that earlier too, I believe. Um, yeah. And I think that one of the things that I tried to do with the broken places was I, I, I did want, I wanted to have these friends who are essentially so close that they're brothers and to show that, you know, the, the bonds of male friendship go beyond just the superficial shit that is shown to us in, you know, TVs and movies to say that. So I think if it was done right, I think the broken places would be a really good ex exhibit of that. Yeah. It's like Patrick says his best pal. So I, yeah. Like me and my, me and my friends will, consistently tell each other hey man love you dude like or like it's all the time and it's never shown and I, I i'm not sure if it's because there's this general idea that showing affection is considered weakness in men i don't i've never understood that at all um i mean i can i can i mean, I, I so I, I coach high school baseball as well and there's been plenty of times where i've had you know kids crying on my shoulder like boys who are trying to hold everything in and they don't want to show it. And it's just like, why don't we, why don't we encourage them to do that kind of stuff? Like I, th I think, and for instance, like uh, to get honest, a big part of the broken places was written because my wife and I suffered a miscarriage and she handled it her way. I handled it mine. And what I noticed was that no one for a while, no one really cared too much about what was going on in my head. And it was just this idea of, well, he's a man, he'll deal with it. And I think that's just 
blatantly wrong. I don't like that. I never have. So I wanted to show, but my friends were like at my side telling me how much they cared. And I, I, I wanted people to see that. So I think that would be cool. So yeah, that's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. I mean, that was one of my favorite things about the broken places is, um, first of all, I mean, beyond the fact that it's dripping in atmosphere, I mean, the broken places will forever be one of the books I always recommend to people. I mean, you made a, your debut is truly stellar and special, dude. Like take that to the bank and cash it hundred percent. But it's, yeah, your characters are, are so real and they're so honest. Yeah. There's no, there's no like, to be quite frank, like bullshit macho kind of still deal going on. And I think that at brass tacks, it's the way that the, the, men are handled in movies and books is because it doesn't really add anything to the actual story beats you know what i mean like your your characters could have been your typical you know like stereotype jock dudes and for the most part the story probably would have played out the same way for the most part i mean your main character could have had some fleshed out but the book wouldn't be as special as it was your book is is amazing because of that 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 added texture that incredible way that you explored that those male relationships and there i rooted for all three of those guys throughout that whole book i didn't want anything bad to happen to any of them and so that was a a huge thing for me when i was reading it i was just i was definitely rooting for everybody and i loved every sense of that book so i really appreciate that thank you yeah man uh, i hope that it came across as well that it's it's you know you can be masculine without being a dick. Like there's a, there is a yeah. difference. hundred percent. Patrick, Patrick is not asking questions. He wants a good horror movie. Have you seen, um, um, nobody will save you yet, Patrick. That's what I was going to recommend. Yeah. That's like, we watched cobweb last night and that movie was so stellar until the last 10 minutes. My wife and I were so just like we just fell out of it so hard it was such a it was a master class intention in my opinion like i was amazed that even the last 10 minutes lost me see i'm gonna watch that one so that's that's definitely makes me kind of apprehensive about it but uh <laughs> that sounds about right patrick <laughs> uh mine would be i've been recommending like crazy i saw it last year i think it came out a couple years ago but i saw it last year it's called the dark and the wicked hmm. that's on it's my on list. shutter it yeah. is intense like if i had to rank like my top you know 20 horror movies of all time it's in my top five <laughs> hey patrick it, you should go it, watch you should go watch exorcist believer i heard it's really good i heard, I heard it's fantastic yeah absolutely good. best 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 movie out this year <laughs> i've seen marabone i really did like marabone All right. I think this is probably the right note to wrap up on. Um, thank you all for coming and uh, thank you for the conversation as well. And um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and hit stop on the recording.